We're hiking into Fern Canyon, which is where they filmed the second Jurassic Park movie. Do you think they left any dinosaurs behind? I hope so. I can't wait to see the Triceratops when we get there. And the Stegosaurus, and maybe even some Velociraptors. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know if I want to see those. Be on the lookout. We've spent a couple of days hanging out in Redwood National Park, which has huge trees and is a huge park because it's actually now the combination of four parks. It is Redwood National and State Parks. And the reason is that when they formed Redwood National Park, it was bordering three California state parks. And then at some point, I don't remember what year it was, the federal government and the state government of California got together and said, why aren't we operating this as one giant location? And that's what you have now. And the reason that you don't know what year it is is because it was multiple years ah. uh, because each kind of section did their own thing. And it, it was over a span of, I want to say, 40 plus years before they ever kind of really actually came together. Oh, good. So I'm off the hook for not remembering the you year. You don't need no dates because it was a lot. And, and honestly, they should have done it years and years before because all it really did was the longer they delayed, the more trees got cut down in the process because... What started as two million, some two hundred million to th lots of lots of acreage up and down the coast of California of these giant redwood trees, basically was reduced to five percent of what the original amount was because of our logging efforts um, back in the late eighteen hundreds and well into the nineteen hundreds, nineteen fifties, sixties, seventies. I think they were still logging this area. So we lost a lot of redwoods, but what's cool is they were able to preserve enough so that you can come visit. Mm -hmm. And there's actually, as I mentioned, there are three state parks that became part of this joint operation with the uh, the national park. And so there's when you look at a map of the national park, there's really kind of a northern section and a southern section. That's how we divided it up. But we found while we were trying to find things that it's really broken into the sections based on the original state parks. And you had commented that you really need a map from each one. You do. You need not only your actual map from the Redwood National Park, but then you need the map from Jadadiah Smith. You need the map from Prairie Creek and you need the map from Del Norte because all of the trails are really, most of the trails, honestly, are in the state park sections of the conglomeration. And despite playing nicely in sharing, they're not playing nice with their maps. So some of the trails are on all, some of them are on none, are none actually. <laughs> yeah. Some of them are on one, but not this one. And so it took me four different maps every day to figure out where we were going and what hikes we were doing. But once you figure out what you want to do, there are some beautiful scenic drives. There's some really nice hikes. Some are longer, some are shorter, and you don't have to take a super long hike to see some beautiful redwoods. So that's what's really nice about this park, I think. What I liked is there are scenic drives. So again, if you only have a short amount of time, if you're just passing through California and want to make this part of your stop, I would encourage you to do so. If you have a weekend, if you have a week, then there's some longer hikes that you can do what gets that gets you deeper into those old growth forests, uh, further away from people. And so you can, you know, really truly immerse yourself in this uh, area. Um, but, you know, again, you can do it as a drive-by or you can do it as a longer stay and you're going to see some amazing and majestic trees no matter where you go. <laughs> I mentioned that we looked at it from the standpoint of a northern part of the park and a southern part of the park. And what we discovered was we ended up staying in Klamath, California, in the town. There's a ton of different RV parks and different ways to camp there. What I liked about it was you're kind of in the middle. So you can go north one day, you could go south one day, which is what we did, or you could spend a couple of days in each direction, however you want to do that. We happened to stay at the Chinook RV Resort. It's nothing fancy, but if you're a Passport America member, they do take your discount there. So we got sites, full hookup sites for half off. So that was really nice, especially in California. If you're not a Passport America member, I'm going to put a link in the description below so you can find out how you can do that. It's, it's basically a membership program where you get half off of your sites. And that was really helpful here. It was. Mosquito. Mosquito. <laughs> Yeah, that was super handy. And I'm glad that we ended up staying in Klamath because 
We didn't really realize it at the time. We actually thought we were staying closer to the northern part. And turns out we were like smack dab in the middle. Because either way, it was like 40 minutes north and 40 minutes south to get to either of like the main sections and those scenic byways. So we had the best of both worlds. Um, We ran into a family at the visitor center in the northern section this morning who said they only had a day to be here. And the ranger really suggested they only stick to the northern half or they would have been spending three hours or more just driving to the southern half and back and wasting all day. So tip, stay in the middle. (laughs) And then you can explore pretty much everything. We kicked off our time in Redwood National Park by driving the Drury Scenic Byway from north to south. And that allowed us to stop at a number of the pullouts along the way to see things like the corkscrew tree, which is three trees all intertwined together. We stopped at the big tree, which is one of the tourist draws here that you can go see. And and that's really cool. You should definitely make that a stop. Um, We stopped at a few of the other pullouts along the way, like the APA Interpretive Trail and just a couple other just scenic pullouts that you can stop at. Another fun thing to do in the southern part of the National Park is Fern Canyon. It was special for you because they filmed one of the Jurassic Park movies there. And we had a really good time exploring that canyon and and seeing something completely different from Redwoods. All right, I know the second Jurassic Park movie was not your favorite. Okay, to be fair, what sequel ever is? But its filming location was pretty cool. Oh, this was epic. Just seeing the Fern Canyon was magnificent all on its own because that's just something unique that you're not really going to see a lot of places. But then also being there and pretending that there's Stegosaurus walking by and that, you know, Dr. Malcolm's walking through. I mean, what's not to love about that? (laughs) I will note that there is a reservation required to come out here now for the parking area. And so they do, I think it's at 150 a day and there's 100 that are available ahead of time and then there are 50 that are released the morning and before at 9 a.m pacific so you have to get online and try to grab that uh, permit for your parking and luckily i noticed that and it was too late to get one early but i grabbed one the morning before and i'm glad i did because you really enjoyed this yeah that was really cool no the map was really confusing and the directions were really confusing about what happens once you get there. So when you leave the parking lot, it's like a short tenth of a mile walk and then all of a sudden it will open up into this canyon. And all of a sudden you're just like, oh, wow, we're here and this is where Jurassic Park was filmed and it's just really cool. And you can just keep walking up the river, just follow the river as far as you really can until it stops or until you want to come back. However, you can also do a loop that takes you up to the ridge of and and around. And you can either get to it right at the head of the river, which we totally missed the first time because you're just in awe of the canyon and it's kind of tucked away behind the ferns. Or when you get all the way to the end, you'll see some stairs. And so that's what we did. We walked all the way through, we saw those stairs, we went up, we went around, and we ended up back at the beginning. Well, and, and then we went back into Fern Canyon. Yeah, yeah. then we went back in because we weren't done seeing it. Yeah, like right. we wanted to see it again. But yeah. Um, recommendation for you have on rain boots. I have on waterproof hikers. They do put foot bridges out seasonally. So I think they're out here mostly in the summer when they're busier. So you don't have to get your feet wet necessarily. But there are some places where with, depending on how high the water level is, even with the foot bridges, you might get a little wet or especially if you lose your footing like I did at one point, you want to make sure you have waterproof boots on. But it wasn't real deep here in, where are we at, in mid-July, late July? I don't yeah. even know what it is. Um, but just something to keep in mind. They warn you that you're going to get your feet wet, and there's a good chance that you might. Well, this is kind of interesting so much. <laughs> Who cares about seasonal foot bridges when you have rain boots on? That's why you always carry all the shoes. <laughs> this in no way is an endorsement for carrying more shoes in an RV. I'm glad I wore my rain boots because I just had fun splashing through the river. I saw a lot of kids and even adults with sandals or Crocs on so that they could splash around. That water is cold. (laughs) Just keep that in mind. But if you're somebody that likes to splash around in the water like I do, your sandals are probably going to be a good idea. (laughs) Well, and keep in mind, because it's not very hot today. I mean, it is late July, but it's only in the 60s out here today because you're right on the coast. So I don't think that water ever gets really warm. (laughs) No, probably not. But... Fern Canyon, worth it. Get the free reservation and get out here. If you're lucky enough to secure a permit for Fern Canyon, you can also then go to Gold Bluffs Beach. And 
basically you're just walking out onto the beach, see the Pacific coast. But what I thought was really cool was if you get all the way out on the beach and then turn around, you see the massive forest of redwoods behind you and the ferns up on the hill. So if nothing else, just walk out there and turn around and, and see the forest behind you. And then as you're driving out, you'll be on Davison Road and near the, I guess, end beginning as you're out towards the 101, uh, there's a little pull-off driveway parking section and you can hike to what's called Trillium Falls. It's a very small waterfall, but it's in the middle of the giant redwoods, so it's really pretty. It's a relatively short half a mile to a mile hike, maybe mile round trip. It's really not that far, um, but that was worth a, you know, worth a visit. And sort of at the base of that area is what they call Elk Meadow. And so early mornings or late evenings, you're probably going to see elk there. We did not see elk there. We saw them somewhere else. But apparently that is a known place to watch. And so there's a bunch of parking and boardwalks where you can watch them there. We actually saw elk as we were headed back up Drury and we were near the Prairie Creek Visitor Center again. It just happened to be the right time of day. And there was a ton of elk, especially males all together, which you said you determined was a, a bachelor they're, grouping? They're a bachelor group, and they will only stay that way up until mating and rutting season, which is coming up in, like, September. Um, so it is usually very unusual to see all the males together, and they had to bend a dozen or more of them all together in a little pod. The females and, and the babies, all they hang out separately. They were on the other side of the road doing their thing, just— sitting there that the guys were kind of prancing around i told you so. one of them was getting married soon so it was a bachelor party yeah. <laughs> and then if we, we looked it up turned out it's a bachelor grouping so i wasn't that far off as always with wild animals especially big things like elk keep your distance no loud noises don't approach them um, stay in your car and because as we were standing there and they are on one side of the fence and we were in our car a couple of them decided to hop the fence and get really close to us. So we just stayed put, took some pictures from the car, and then kept on driving. Um, because you never know when they might decide to, like, charge or cross the road or anything. So you just got to be on your game there. On our second day in the park, we headed north. And we ended up on Howland Hill Road, I think is how it's said. Um, because that's how you can get to a couple of different really big groves there that are they're kind of the standouts of the northern part of the park. We started by hiking the Grove of Titans, and that is a, about a two-mile round-trip hike. Part of it is on a boardwalk because recently in 2022, they built this metal boardwalk to protect the roots of the trees because too many people were going off trail, and the more you climb on the roots and you get too close to the tree, they were and damaging all the ferns and the undergrowth. So now there's a raised platform so you can get out there and see them, take all your pictures, uh, but you're not damaging the environment. I, I would say real quick, too, that probably makes it easier for a lot of people yes. to get out to see those really big trees because it's it's they're stairways. But just because of the way it's a raised boardwalk, it's it's really easy to walk on. That's true. It's not ADA accessible because there are stairs, but you're not worrying about tripping over the roots quite as much in that section. Yeah. So you're a good, good point on that one. And those were some of the biggest trees in the park, like the tallest. I mean, those were those were massive. There, so there's cool. a reason they call it the Titans. Yes. <laughs> And then we headed out to Stout Grove. What's unique about Stout Grove is it's right along the river. And so because when the river floods, it brings all this debris up and buries the roots in like a layer of soil, there's hardly anything else growing. So there's there's no other trees or ferns, hardly at all on the forest floor. So you really see the expanse of these massive redwoods because you see it from trunk to tip. And that's all you see, as opposed to like, you know, you see behind us here and you see a lot of greenery in the Stout Grove. There's no greenery. It's just redwood. <laughs> yeah, I think the way the National Park puts it is, is that they kind of they're sort of the focus of everything or the star of the show there because there isn't a lot of stuff growing up around them. And it really we weren't sure about that, but it really did make a difference in what's there. And what's interesting about that grove, too, is there's a lot of trees that are down that, that naturally fell. And one of the, the volunteers was here told me she kind of thinks of it as sort of the, the Disneyland of the National Park because it's just an easy hike for people to walk in there. And there's all kinds of trees that you can see are still standing, but there's all kinds of them that are down and you get a feel for how big they are and you get right up to them. And so I, that was a really neat experience too. For sure. And I think as far as that one is concerned, accessibility wise, they still will say none of them are ADA accessible. You're going down a pretty steep, actually a paved slope, but then the, the bottom is kind of a flat 
um, dirt covered walkway. I did see a lady down there with a walker. So not in a wheelchair, but with a walker and she seemed to be doing okay. So if you do have some limited mobility or limited walking, there are options, I think. Yeah, I think it's hard packed enough that, that you could do it. It's all up to, you know, what your abilities are, but it's it's worth a chance anyway, yeah. I think. It Very was really... different than the other ones. There's not the big roots and steps and everything. So yeah. that would be your closest ADA accessible one. But I really like that one. I just love the, the ones where because they have fallen and they've cut them, A, they've cut them off. So you're standing there in like this giant trunk behind you. But then when you realize the ones that have fallen and they're laying across the forest floor and it just goes on, your eye just keeps following it on and on and on. And you're like, oh, oh my gosh, like that's a down tree. And it, it just looks like a, a sidewalk. <laughs> well, we discovered it, it was the walk to the, the Grove of Titans, where it has the tunnel kind of thing that you walk through where trees have fallen and it sort of created a natural tunnel and you walk up to it. And at first you're like, did they put a wall here? And then you realize, no, that's a tree that had fallen. And it just it's just massive. And then the trees that are growing on top of the trees and the ferns. I just love the ferns. It's just so pretty around here. Like, it's just the way that the ecosystem and all of the plants thrive on each other to survive. While I was filling out my Junior Ranger book, one of the pages was talking about how life reuses itself. So when a tree falls and it recontributes to the you know forest floor. And one of the things on that page was talking about an octopus tree. And I understood what they meant, but I had not seen one in real life until we rounded this bend and found this tree. And as you can clearly see, the octopus tree is when a tree grows on top of a downed tree and its root system spreads out along the base of the downed tree. So I'll step back here so you can see that. And it's just really cool, especially because these are such massive sized trees. So it's like truly larger than life here. <laughs> but it just is a testament to why you should get the Junior Ranger book, because you learn things that you probably wouldn't have otherwise. I will point out we're here in what, late July. Um, the, the weather has been cool. It's been fifties and sixties, uh, and we're doing okay right now. There's a few spots here. You want to watch for mosquitoes. I, I thought of that as you thought about the ecosystem <laughs> and things thriving on each the other. The, mos away. the mosquitoes are trying to thrive on, on us. So that's why you're seeing a swat every so often. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a, a really nice experience. Um, we haven't had sun for a few days and we had sun and blue skies, which if you get a chance, especially if you're out on a trail and you start out and it's cloudy and then the sun comes out and there's blue skies, make sure you look around and up again, even at things you've seen, because the trees look really different uh, depending yeah. on your background, whether it's a gray background or a blue background. Or if you get the fog and the, the marine layer that's come through. And, you know, you talked about it's cool 50s and 60s, but that's the high here. Like, it's yeah. never going to get any warmer than that. Doesn't matter what time of year you come here. So you'll see some people in short sleeves and shorts, but for the most part, you're wearing long sleeves, long pants. You might want a jacket in the morning. Um, because it is kind of chilly and it's damp because you've got that fog coming off of the coast. So this is California, but you're not wearing your bikini here in this park. <laughs> <laughs> we mentioned earlier that you're going to need a permit to go to Fern Canyon. If you want to go to the Tall Trees Trail, you will also need a permit for that. And that one you have to get in advance online only. So just keep that in mind if you're planning to come here and you want to do that hike, uh, jump on as soon as you can to reserve your permit for that. We didn't do that soon enough, so we didn't hike that one. There's also plenty of other trails in this park that we did not hike and don't require a permit. Uh, there's a hike behind us here that you can do. There's, there's hikes all over. Um, so kind of get your map maybe plan more in advance than we did. <laughs> we really only planned a week or so because we didn't really know we were coming here. But there's a lot to see and do here, including one random thing that has nothing to do with the Redwoods at all, except that it's in the park, but it has to do with World War II history. <laughs> and that is that <clears throat> when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, there were concerns about other attacks happening along the coast, the west coast of the U.S., including California. So the military set up radar stations to keep an eye on things. And what's really unique in a couple of ways about this is the one they set up here that's now in this park was disguised to be a farm. So they had all kinds of power, you know, power generation equipment. They had the radar, they had guns, they had everything they would need to keep track of things. But they built a fake farmhouse and a fake barn 
And so anybody looking at it from the air, from the sea, from the road, were thinking they were going by a farm. And it was a it was a military radar installation. Yeah. So they essentially built a concrete bunker to house the actual operations and then built a facade wooden walls and roof and gables, including like your act like a fake gable window up on top that goes nowhere, a fake barn door that makes it look like the pulley system that you would have loaded hay up into the barn. Um, a two privy outhouse, which apparently actually was real, <laughs> but it yeah. completed the look. And then they I think they said they did have some like cows and chickens running around to make it actually look like a real farm. So it, that's, I don't know, we, we like that kind of stuff. So it was worth the drive to us to go see it. Well, but. I was going to say, I mentioned it's unique in a couple of ways. One of them is the fact that it was this sort of completely camouflaged as a farm radar installation. The other is that it still exists. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, the, some of the wooden cladding in the walls have, have deteriorated and those are gone. So you're only seeing the bunker walls. But the fact that it's still there, it makes it unique in the U.S. as well. And if you drive that little coastal road out there, you get some gorgeous views of the Pacific Ocean. And our little surprise, a bald eagle was out on one of the treetops. Um, we could try to drop a picture here. He was like super tiny, so it, not very well. But through the binoculars, I was like, oh my gosh, there's a bald eagle. Like, it's so cool. <laughs> so yeah, keep an eye out for things you never know with wildlife around here. Always have your binoculars. You're a big one on that. But actually... Here, the things to look for are on the ground. Like, you don't need your binoculars. What you need to look for here are the banana slugs and the yellow-spotted millipedes. <laughs> yeah, the banana slugs. The millipedes, we didn't see as many of the banana slugs. It was Fern Canyon, right, where we saw a ton of oh, those? a ton of them, yeah. There were a ton of them there, and there's one little kid, like, trying to collect. I don't know how many he had, but I'm assuming he wasn't taking them home. <laughs> he six on a stick. <laughs> <laughs> but they're pretty cool to see as well. So, keep yeah, keep an eye above for the trees and then down on the ferns and down below for some of the insects you're going to see here in particular. We had two days here at Redwood National and State Parks. <laughs> it's weird to say it that way, but that's what it's called. We did a full two days, and we enjoyed them. I think if we had more time to stick around, we probably would. We could get at least a couple of more days out of this park because there's different hikes we could do. You could do some in the morning, some in the afternoon. It's just there's a lot of opportunities here. But if you only have one day and you only have a few hours— I would actually personally stick to the northern section. Drive that Howland Hills Road, stop at Stout Grove, stop at Grove of the Titans, because that's where you're going to see the most concentration of the giant redwoods, and you're going to be able to get right up close and personal with them. I, I would say that from what we saw anyway, based on the hikes and the different stops we did, it felt like you could get closer to the trees in the northern section than we did in the southern section. I really liked this park. I think there's a lot of different opportunities to do different things and see different things here. You would mention, you know, we could do four days. I don't know if I'd do a week. I mean, do, do trees all start to look alike after a while? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> they do, but I think there's other things to do here in the area. Like I said, it's never really going to get above 60 degrees, but the coast is really pretty. There's the river, so if you like fishing or you just want to, like, take a little, you know, your tube out in the river, there are other things to see in this area. And so you also, you wouldn't have to kill yourself trying to drive from one end of the park to the other because, like I said, it is a good 40-plus minutes, hour and a half from end to end. So if you have a few more days, space it out a little bit. Yeah. If you have a week, get here. If you have a day, get here. Redwood National and State Parks is a winner in my book. I think you should check it out. In the meantime, keep on trekking. And we'll see you out there. 